Good morning and welcome to North Central Christian Church. Yeah, let's say that again. Good morning. Good morning. Well, looky there, you guys sound great this morning. Uh, we've got a nice sunshiny day after some rain this past weekend. Uh, we're glad to be here this morning and we're glad to be here to worship God in His house, in His church. And as I looked at the sign this morning, it says, Welcome to God's church who's missing. And you are not missing, you are here. So we are glad that you are here. Now we're going to get started this morning by focusing in on the cross. And we're going to sing together, uh, There's Power in the Blood. Let's all be standing as we sing together a uh, beautiful uh, hymn, Power in the Blood. contact information, just name, address, phone number. Uh, that would be great. You can put that in one of the boxes that are in the, on the side, on either side and in the back. Uh, this is also where you can put the, um, uh, your offerings as far as our regular attenders and members. A big thank you goes out to everyone who has contributed to the camera fund. Now, we, as this has progressed, we've had a hard time kind of keeping up with it. So the good news is we actually have more in the fund than what's on the, on the bulletin. So as it works out, we've had some folks. Yes, yes okay. We actually even had, we, we figured it was about around 1,200, and then we had the individual step up and say, I'm going to give 50, but I want to challenge anybody else who wants to give another 50 today to do it too, just to make sure we're over the top, okay? So, but we, we have done it. We have got there. And so anything that help that you have helped in the past, thank you. So now the next step then is to begin to, we're doing some research as to exactly the, the equipment that we're looking at and then all the time and effort that it takes to get everything hooked up and all together. So that will take a, a period of time, uh, but we are there. So again, thanks to everyone who helps out with that. And if you're out there uh, online, 
uh, or perhaps you're back at home and you helped with that as well. We, we thank you for that. Folks, I can't stress enough how important it is to be helpful to the local church, and you all have done just that. And uh, I, I thank you for that uh, over a period of time and continue to give in your regular tithes and additional offerings as well. And for, for some reason, if you're back at home and you don't have a local church, we want to encourage you to give to your local church, but you can, you can think about us. We're here at North Citrus Christian Church, so uh, you feel free to uh, swing by the church and drop a gift or go online uh, to our website uh, that's out there, and you can put that information down too at uh, northcitruschristian.com. Okay, so again, thank you for that help. Next week, we are doing a foundations class. Uh, somebody asked, well, what is a foundations class? I'm glad you asked. A foundations class simply is an opportunity for you to come to learn more about the church. Uh, it's an opportunity to come. Uh, and we've tried to encourage everybody in the entire church to go through this class. Um, we're going to do lunch for you, have that available, and then we'll sit down uh, for the first part of the afternoon and go over some information that points us back to Scripture, points us back to the biblical foundation of the New Testament church, and explains um, why we believe the way we do based upon the God's Word, uh, based upon Scripture. So we encourage you to come to that. Uh, I've got a sign-in sheet. I'm going to pass it back around. James, I'm going to start with you. So you can just kind of look at that and get a chance and move on. Okay, so if uh, the same sheet that passed around last week, but if, if you've you've not made it or you want to come back and bring a friend with you or you want to come back and kind of refresh your memory uh, feel free to do that we'll, we'll get it all around I know we have to skip every other row so we got to kind of have to stretch to get it to one person to the next but that is happening next week so we want to encourage you to be a part of that uh, foundation class that is coming okay um, just a quick reminder on some of the things that we have uh, available in the back uh, we have ordered uh, name tags. We have ordered memorial plaques. If you've ordered those and for some reason haven't paid for those yet, now would be a good time to go ahead and do that. Uh, the name tags are $9. Memorial plaques are $10. And we can still continuously take orders for that. But we've already put in the first order for that. Uh, coffee mugs are also available in the back. Ryan, help me out. Grab a coffee mug back there. It's just right to your left. Hold it up. Act like you got a big... Uh, cup of joe in hand okay there's the coffee mug and there's the picture of mr ryan uh this is our latest win dixie man uh, here locally in beverly hills uh, that's five dollars um, for the cup not for the man um, but we're good <laughs> and we'll be good to go so those are all available and plus also uh, don't forget about the t-shirts or logos if you want to put something in your logo and have i see lots of people already out there uh, a couple uh, even walk through the door we're about this size and she had a little shirt on and had the logo going. It's like, hey, we're twins today. So looky there. So that's great. So that's an opportunity just to, uh, to be of help uh, as well in that regard. Okay, always remember our Wednesday night small group at 6 o'clock and Sunday morning class uh, before church at 9. So that is available to you as well. For our prayer time today, I'm going to simply ask that... Uh, we take some silent prayer before I go ahead and lead uh, in prayer. Folks, I've come to realize that all of us have things on our hearts and on our minds, and we don't necessarily always share those things. We don't always necessarily put them down as a prayer request. Sometimes they're just something that maybe we're dealing with personally, maybe something within our own family, maybe something at work, maybe extended friends or neighbors. Um, and I want just to take some time before God. I just want you to be in a position just to take some time. So many times we enter into prayer just talking to God. And we just need to more so take the time first to just kind of listen to him. Or sometimes just express our emotions to him. Sometimes that may mean tears. Um, sometimes that may mean just being silent before him. So we're going to take a good uh, uh, 30 seconds or so with silent prayer. <coughs> And then uh, I'll go ahead and lead. So whatever's on your heart and mind, just to lift that up to God silently. And then I'll go ahead and lead in prayer this morning.
Father God, we continue our prayers. Lord, you know our hearts, even when words can't express what we're going through, uh, perhaps even in the world at large, trying to make sense of it all, trying to find our responsibility and try to find uh, what you've called us to. Lord, I pray that uh, those that are hearing this prayer back at home, that they too, they will just lift up their prayers uh, to you, uh, those that may be in the parking lot, Father, those that are here this morning. Lord, we lift up our, our hearts, and we pray that you will direct our hearts according to what is pleasing to your will, and help us not to get in the way. Help us not with our, with our own agenda, our own steps, uh, to go against your steps. Father, just help us to look to you for direction in everything that's said and done through the power of your Holy Spirit. There are so many names and uh, come to mind as we think of our prayer list. I'm not going to take the time to list all those, but those that have upcoming procedures this week, those that, uh, that uh, had funerals this past week, and even as we speak, those that uh, are saying goodbyes uh, to members of their family, uh, health issues, and Lord, this, those that still that uh, may be back at home and, and still want to be, be safe and, and secure, and Lord, I just pray that you watch over them as well. Lord, help us this morning as we lift up our praise to you. Help us this morning as we just look to see what you desire to accomplish uh, with today and the glory that we can bring to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a beautiful song that simply says, Open the Eyes. Of my heart, Lord. I've really been challenged by this song. Um, I can't help but to think that there's things over the past week that, that I personally have done that, that I shouldn't have done. And there's things over the past week that I didn't do <laughs> that I should have done. There's things I've said that I wish I could take back. There's things that I probably didn't say that I probably should have had the opportunity to speak up and say. And I'm just praying that you just reflect upon where God has you and reflect upon the fact that we just we want to be used for God um, not only this week uh, ahead but we want to be used from God from this point forward um, as we are on a mission for God open the eyes of my heart Lord Holy, 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 I 
on the cross today we want to use a couple songs leading up to communion the first song is uh, simply entitled same power the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us and so let's sing this as we prepare our hearts and minds uh, of these next two songs uh, before our communion together I can see what is raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face. Every fear of the unknown, I can hear all God's children singing out. We will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wait, lives in us, lives in us. that I'm sure many of you have heard of and simply entitled The Old Rugged Cross. We'll sing this as we prepare to take communion. Um, again, I'll remind you that uh, when communion is, is passed to you, um, the gentleman will be in some mask and gloves. Uh, they'll be holding the trays. It's a double cup method, so there's juice in the top, bread in the bottom. All you need to do is just simply take out the double cup. Okay, No need to touch the trays itself uh, so that it, will be, it would be safely passed from one to another. 186 out of the old rugged cross. i 
Perhaps you're watching us at home right now, and I want to encourage you, if you are home, just go ahead and find some uh, juice uh, that's nearby in the refrigerator or cracker or whatever's available, and you can feel free to uh, join in communion with us. So we focus on the cross, uh, the verse of scripture that you may glance at today it comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. It seems to me we're kind of uh, experiencing the opposite in our world today uh, as we take a look at news and society around us. In fact, many today uh, insist upon their own rights and not, not taking up anybody else's cross and certainly not denying themselves. Why, we ask? Because, because we can. You see, God has given us free will. We have a choice to make. And because we can, then we can insist on our own way in life. We can uh, have a bad attitude. We can choose anything that we desire to do because we can we can very simply complicate our lives with our own sin if for no other reason than because we can but guess what as christians i can too philippians 4 13 says i can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And because of Jesus Christ and the cross of Christ, I can overcome sin and death and look forward to eternal life through the cross. I can deny myself and pick up my cross and follow him. I can choose a good attitude through Jesus Christ, my Lord. I can be on mission for God because of the cross. Because he did... We can focus your reflection today, not on the things that we can do simply because we can, but rather focus on what Christ did for us upon the cross. And simply because of what he did, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Let's pray. Father God, it's so easy to fall into the, the trap of just doing things because we can. And we know it's not best. We know it's not according to your glory, according to your will, but we just, we get tired, we get frustrated, we just, just do it because we can. We say words that don't need to be said, we, we do things that don't need to be done, we, it's just because we can. But Lord, we know that that also is 
results in wages of sin is death. And Lord, we are grateful for what you did upon the cross of Christ in giving your son, not only the death, but the burial and the resurrection. And because of what you did, we can find our way forward. Lord, give us strength to do all things through you because we can, because you did. I love you, Lord. Thank you now for this bread and this cup. And just pray that it helps us in moving forward on your mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue our sermon series, in fact, the last message in the sermon series on the search for meaning, focus on the cross. We want to use the chorus again of Father, I Adore You as a sermon prep as uh, George prepares to come and share with us today. Before we begin the message, some of you don't know what happened, but last week 
after worship here, uh, Brenda took a fall and she fractured her left arm in the wrist area. It's a very serious break. She's scheduled for surgery this Thursday. And she's in a lot of discomfort, a lot of pain. And there's some other problems that, that are associated with that, but you could join with me if you would in praying for Brenda's speedy recovery. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their prayers and for the food that's been brought in, for the support that you have shown for us, the love that you share. My heart is gladdened by seeing Roberta here today. And Roberta, our hearts go out to you. You are indeed our sister. We're going to talk about the cross. It has become the quintessential symbol for the Christian faith. You can find it all over the place. You can find it on bumper stickers, coffee mugs, lapel pins, necklaces, tattoos. You can sometimes even see it on baked goods. I don't know that there's a whole lot wrong with that. Uh, sometimes it's a fashion statement. I don't like the cross as a fashion statement. If you wear a cross, there's nothing wrong with that if it's to remind you or others that you are a follower of Jesus. In 2004, a girl wrote to Billy Graham with a question. My high school graduation, for my high school graduation, my aunt gave me a very nice gold cross to wear as a necklace. And she said it would bring me good luck if I wore it. Is she right? <coughs> Billy Graham didn't write back and tell her that her aunt was silly, which he could have. But here's what he wrote back and said. I'm sure your aunt is sincere, but no, she is not right. No piece of jewelry or any other object has any power to help us or bring us any benefit. And after a few more words, he wrote this. Centuries ago, Christians used the image of the cross to identify themselves as followers of Jesus, who had died on a cross for their salvation. I wish it had the same meaning today, although I know that for many people it is only a meaningless piece of jewelry. Well, the casual use of the cross that we see today would not have been what the first Christians did or would have expected after Jesus was crucified and even in the immediate centuries that followed that. They were dealing with a huge scandal because crucifixion was absolutely the most shameful way that a person could be put to death. There was a terrible shame affixed to it. It was something that if you followed someone or had a leader who was crucified, then you in part were also shamed. You owned part of that shame. And that's why the story of the cross in the early church is so amazing because even though the shame connected with it, those early Christians used it to identify themselves. Now there's one other symbol that they used and, and it, it was the, the fish symbol and you've seen that and sometimes people have those on bumpers too. They're very nice. But the church was a community that was able to embrace Christ even in the shame of the cross. I know years ago when the electric chair was still in some states the method of uh, putting condemned people to death a preacher said wearing the cross to early Christians would be sort of like one of us going around with a a little electric chair hanging on a necklace. Not a very pretty thing to the early Christians. But speaking of the shame of the cross, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus was willing to endure the shame for our sakes. 
So let's read that. And this is uh, coming from Hebrews. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, in today's world, at least in the Christian world, we hear Christian teachers and preachers telling us to embrace the cross. Embrace the cross. Well, by that I hope they mean to embrace what transpired on the cross, what took place on the cross, and the effects of Jesus being on the cross, not the cross itself. For if we embrace the cross itself without giving a thought to what was accomplished there, then it becomes nothing more than a, a, a crude wooden idol. It is what transpired there that we embrace when we talk about embracing the cross. It is the fact that Jesus gave his life for our sins. We don't talk much about Jesus being humiliated while he hung on the cross, but it was a terrible humiliation. We recognize, I suppose, that this humiliation was overshadowed by his physical agony. But yes, he was humiliated. The triumph, though, the triumphal irony of this is that Jesus' moment of greatest humiliation is also the moment of one of his greatest exaltations, one of his greatest moments of glory. If you want to talk about glory, when we see Jesus on the cross, we see the length of which God will go in order to save us from ourselves. When we see Jesus on the cross, we see him giving everything that he has, including his life, for every single person who has ever been born, walked, and breathed. Everyone on the face of the earth, even, and especially those who mock him, scorn him, reject him. And those who just don't know what to think about him. But you know that to hundreds of thousands, even millions of people, the message of the cross is foolishness. Foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I think for people who don't believe and don't understand, people without faith, it's just silly for them, just absolutely silly. Um, it's a strange message to them, you see, to people who've never experienced this life-changing force, its power to them. It is foolishness, and this word foolishness comes from the Greek moriha, which is the ancient root of our word moron. So it seems moronic to them. It's just moronic that we would look upon this cross business and value it for any reason in our lives. I just read where some churches, I mean, just recently read where some churches are removing the cross from their buildings and their literature. Um, like you have a cross on a hymnal or whatever. They're taking those out because the cross is offensive to people. Yeah. Uh, it's offensive to people who aren't saved. But now listen, this is important. Removing what represents the cross of Jesus from a building, like, like this one behind me, we could take it out, and that's bad enough. That's a step toward removing Christ from our church and our lives. And that's bad enough, but it isn't nearly as bad as removing the personal cross of which we are to lift up and bear. The one 
that Jonathan mentioned in his message before communion. And that is what Shane Claiborne meant when he said, if we remove the cross, we are in danger of promoting a very cheap grace. Perhaps it should make us uncomfortable. Now what's Claiborne mean by cheap grace? I'll answer that with a quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you never heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German pastor. When Hitler came to power, he openly opposed Hitler, was actually involved in, a, in an effort to assassinate Hitler. And he was hung because of that by the Nazis. But here's what he wrote about cheap grace. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. We should find it very interesting, folks, that Jesus said something in opposition to cheap grace. Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, here we go, Jonathan, thank you for that. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. And this fits in with something else Jesus said early in his ministry. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Matthew 7, 13, 14. There are two roads, Jesus said, and everybody is required to pick one. You're going to come to a fork in the road and you're going to choose it. Now, don't, you, you can't be like Yogi Berra who lived way out in the country and he gave someone instructions on how to get to the house and he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> but there are two roads. There's the wide road of the world that leads to destruction. And there's the narrow road of self-denial, meaning that we deny ourselves of the so-called pleasures of the world. So one of them is wide and easy to travel. A lot of people choose that. It's the road of the way of the world, the road without the cross. It's the road in which we don't deny ourselves anything, but let ourselves be absorbed into the grunge of the world. And it is so easy. It is so inviting. The other road's an error. It leads to life, but few seem to choose that path. It's a road in which we do deny ourselves these so-called pleasures of the world. They can have them. The one in which we make the world know that we do belong to Jesus. By the way we live. By the way we talk by where our eyes go, by what we read, and by whom we associate with. And Jesus says, make a choice, make a decision. This you have to do. Some people want Jesus to do everything for them without doing one single thing that expresses their love for him. They don't understand the depth of commitment that a Christian is supposed to have. Maybe none of us do when we're first saved. But as we grow into maturity in Christ, we ought to get a handle on this commitment business. But they don't. They're like people going on a hike who think it should be walking down the sidewalk at home. You go to a wilderness area and what's going to happen to you? You take a hike in the wilderness area, and it's not going to be on a sidewalk. I have here a list of actual written responses from comment cards given to staff members 
of a United States Wilderness Recreation Area. Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. <laughs> Another one writes, too many bugs, spiders, and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness area to get rid of these pests. <laughs> Please pave the trails. Chair lifts need to be in some places so that we can get to wonderful views without having to hike to them. <laughs> the coyotes, now this can happen right here. The coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. Oh, a small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. I don't know what, this is nuts. Stole my jar of pickles? Is there a way I could get reimbursed? Please call. Escalators would help on steep uphill sections. A McDonald's would be nice at the trailhead. <laughs> and finally, here's a person of few words right too many rocks in the mountains. <laughs> now this indicates that these people don't really know what's going on. <clears throat> they don't understand what it means to be in a wilderness area. They're looking for something convenient, something comfortable, something easy, which does not come with the territory. Well, maybe we better think about ourselves. Are we looking for something easy, something comfortable, where someone else does it all, where we are saved by the blood of Christ and we claim the cross, but just go along and come to church on Sunday or maybe not, even when we can and even when we know we should, we don't. And we think everything is fine. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. Here's a lady right here who was married 63 years, and she and Jerry were sweethearts in school before that. Do you think that they remained married 63 years by each of them not contributing to the marriage? If you think that, you're silly. Because they did. If you think you can be in Christ day in, day out, and not show your love for him, it's not going to work. You're not fooling anyone but yourself. If we're looking for something convenient and comfortable, then we truly don't understand this death of commitment called for by God from those who claim to belong to him. And if we do that, we don't know what he wants and what he expects because we don't know the Bible. Boy, we do want it easy and fast. There's a Russian comedian. I think he hangs out around uh, Branson, Missouri now. His name is uh, Yakov Smirnov. Came from the Ukraine back when it was owned by Russia. And he said when he first came to the United States, he was amazed at the incredible variety of instant products. He said, on my first shopping trip, I saw powdered milk. You add water, you get milk. Wow. Then I saw powdered orange juice. You add water, you get orange juice. Wow. He said, then on another shelf down another aisle, I saw baby powder and thought, what a country this is. <laughs> <laughs> but some things just aren't that easy, are they? Now listen, if you have given yourself to Jesus Christ, make sure that you're in it for the long haul. Amen. Amen. And make sure you can pull the weight of the cross. You ever see a commercial on TV where a man's sitting in a chair at a tattoo parlor expressing his love for his girlfriend by having her name tattooed on his arm? And partway through the procedure, he asks how much it's going to cost, and, and the tattoo artist looks at him and says, to tattoo the name Donna on your arm, 
cost fifty dollars. And the guy pulls his cash out and says, Oh no, I only have forty one bucks. And the tattoo man stops abruptly. And in the next scene, this guy and Donna are walking down the street and she is not happy with him. And he's yelling at her, I get it fixed later. And the camera zooms in on the tattoo which reads, I love Don. <laughs> <laughs> now I've said this before, I am not a fan of Jesus Christ. I think at one time I was a fan of Jesus, I'm not now. I'm not a fan. I'm a follower and there's a big difference. I'm not a fan. I'm a follower. I'm a player. That doesn't mean everyone's got to be a preacher. No. But it means you cannot watch from the sidelines and claim Jesus Christ and do it legitimately. Amen. It's a lot easier to be a fan than it is a follower or a player. You can be a fan from a distance and be relatively unaffected. But followers have their lives turned upside down. Do you think Jesus is telling us to take up our cross and follow him is an isolated scripture? Listen to some other accounts where he talks about it. Luke 14, 25 through 27. Great crowds were following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple, and you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross and follow me. There's that self-denial. There's that love. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to the disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross, and follow me. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. You want to know what the greatest challenge to the cross is today when it comes to taking up our own personal cross for Christ? The greatest challenge of the day, of this day, I'll tell you what it is, it's hard for our generation to swallow something that will demand change in the way we live, in the way we think, in the way we act. We want it both ways. The fact of the matter is that the cross is outrageously offensive. It needs to be. We read Jesus' words in these verses and ask, you want me to do what? You want me to, what? wait a minute, wait a minute here, Lord. I don't think I signed on for this cross business. That's what we want to say. Just, just give it to me. Look, I was in a church in Indiana, a lady in the church, had a male friend and he was dying of cancer. And she said he needs to be baptized. So I went and talked to the guy. He said, I, 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 I want to be baptized. I said, why do you want to be baptized? He said, I, I don't want to go to hell. I'm afraid of hell. I said, that's the only reason? He said, that's right. I said, we're going to talk about this some more, but you understand that in our church we baptize by immersion. Well, he said, look, can't you just put me in the shower and turn the water on or something? <laughs> he was serious. There was nothing to prevent the man from being immersed, but he wasn't willing to do it because why? I do not know. He just wasn't going to have it. And he didn't have it. You want me to do what? If we have ears to hear Jesus shouts at us through the pages of the New Testament, that's, that's where we open this up and start reading it. And then we go, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute here. Hold up. You want me to do what? And you want to hear the answer come back? It comes right in the ear shouting at us from these pages. I want you 
to live a cross-centered life, which means to live a Christ-centered life. And that's the greatest challenge of the cross, living a Christ-centered Christ life. But if and when we do something wonderful happens to us, our spiritual life grows strong, our prayers become something to look forward to, Bible reading becomes a joy, church attendance becomes very important in our lives, pretty soon our open display of faith builds confidence and trust in others who are struggling with their own cross. You don't know it. If there were 12 people and I was preaching to 12 people, it would be one sermon. Now we got what? 30 some people here today. How many we have? Okay. Well, you can tell me later. Uh, uh, 35, uh, less than 40 people, I'd say, just to look. That's, that's this sermon. If this place was packed, I'm telling you, I would be on fire preaching my heart out. That's what happens to us up here in the pulpit. Jonathan can agree with that. He knows it. Because there's something about us being together in worship that just puts us on fire for God, for Christ. I'm sorry, I just cannot get on fire for Christ sitting in my living room in my jammies watching the TV screen. And I feel for people who cannot come, who cannot come. That's one thing. But I got something to say to you folks who just don't come. You might not want to hear it. But there are two roads and you're going to have to choose either the broad one to perdition or the narrow one to salvation. What you cannot afford to do is to be like the imaginary creature invented by Dr. Seuss, a creature by the name of the Zoad. Z-O-A-D, the Zoad. Did I ever tell you about the young Zoad? who came to a sign at the fork of the road. He looked one way and the other way too. The Zod had to make up his mind what to do. Well, the Zod scratched his head and his chin and his pants, and he said to himself, I'll be taking a chance. If I go to place one, that place may be hot, so how will I know if I like it or not? On the other hand, though, I'll feel such a fool if I go to place two and find it's too cool. In that case, I may catch a chill and turn blue. So place one may be best and not place two. Place safe, cried the Zode. I'll play safe. I'm no dunce. I'll simply start off to both places at once. And that's how the Zode, who would not take a chance, went no place at all with a split in his pants. Theodore Seuss Geisel. Okay, some people, I trust not anyone here, are like the Zod. They try to compromise. The narrow road is too, what, narrow? In fact, the world has a phrase for that. They call this narrow path, narrow-minded, because it's intolerant, it's too strict. The little of Jesus is a good thing, they say, but it's possible to be too upright, too moral, too straight-laced, too pure, so loosen up, we're told. Don't be so serious. Mix a little worldliness in with your faith. Take the broad way. In fact, the world has a word for this. They call it broad-mindedness, tolerance. Be accepting. Excuse me, I am not accepting. And I'm not very broad-minded. You'll find that out if you talk to me for a little bit. I'm just not. But that other road is inviting. And if you think I don't know how inviting it is, I walked on it for a lot of years. And you know what I got from it? Empty promises. Heartbreak an almost a ruined life and marriage. 
Thank God Jesus Christ came into our lives. Thank God for that. But know this, you have got to make a choice. And if there's anyone here today that has not taken up that full commitment, that cross, you can't put it off. If you do that, you'll end up like the soda, not going anywhere except where you don't want to go. See, by choosing not to decide, you will have already decided. But Jesus says, make a choice, him or the world. Don't put it off. Now pray with me. The world is inviting, Father. So inviting that sometimes we want to say, well, this little thing here is not so bad. I can sample some of that. Or that over there looks like a lot of fun. I'll give that a whirl. You always take me back. So I'll just do that and then I'll just come on back. Father, what we do not realize in those cases is that we go one step too far and we're just not ever going to come back. So we need to divorce ourselves from the world. And Lord, we should know it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy life or have fun or take up those pleasures that you look at as legitimate. It simply means that we are to live a Christ-centered, cross-centered life. Help us in that regard, please. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. amen. Thank God that Jesus has made room for all of us at the cross. When he died upon that cross, it wasn't for the person next to you only. It wasn't for your past relatives, but it's for you. And so that uh, invitation is to all. So we want to encourage you uh, to make a decision, as you will, uh, to give your life to Jesus Christ or to become a part of this church. Uh, we encourage you to do that as we sing together and stand a room at the cross. hit and it's like oh I sure hope they come back and sure enough they came back in full force and have been here as regular attenders and as we have uh, sat down and have talked a little bit um, Brian shared with me some of his background um, with a uh, Catholic upbringing uh, being uh, sprinkled as a child uh, and then um, uh, also as time went on uh, with uh, your first wife uh, who has since uh, passed on um, was baptized into Christ at a church that you were involved with. And then lo and behold, a high school uh, friend and sweetheart going back over the years stepped back into his life 
and she had made no connection until she kept caught back up with uh, with Brian and so Paula entered his life and then they uh, started to uh, uh, get get involved uh, back in church again uh, but Paula has yet to make that uh, decision to be uh, baptized to be immersed in the Christ so she's going to make that decision today so uh, we're going to take a uh, confession of faith. Brian's uh, confession is simply just a reaffirmation of his original commitment uh, to Christ, having already been baptized, and then uh, we'll take Paula's confession along with him uh, so that she will prepare herself to be baptized uh, today. So if y'all just take my hand together here and just repeat after me. I believe, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him. And I accept Him. As my Lord. As my Lord. My Lord and Savior. And Savior. Amen. 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 Brian, we'll give you a chance if you want to say anything. Okay. Man, a few words. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, what we're going to do at this time is we're going to go ahead and get ready uh, with Paula and myself. And we'll sing this final verse together of Room at the Cross. And then after that, uh, Doreen will lead us in, in a song, get ready for the baptism, and then we'll have a little song after the baptism. And then, George, if you could just close off the day with a, with a prayer at the end. So uh, if anybody else has a decision to make, George will be here uh, up front and can certainly take uh, uh, your decision as well. All right. Okay. 